Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to those of you joining from different time zones. My name is Jordan Lim, and I work at the National Geographic Society on the education team. We're so lucky to have you, everyone with us today for another Explore Classroom episode. Right now, we've got a great, great topic. We're talking about caving and archaeology and anthropology, and it's going to be a good time. So quick little introduction. Um, while there are a lot of people working on the project with us today, I have an intro for Marina and Becca. They're um, biological anthropologists and National Geographic Explorers. And Becca is an American um, archaeologist. And they're working on the Rising Star Cave System in South Africa on a three-week expedition. Uh, the cave system was the site of an astonishing discovery of over 1,500 fossils, and one of them being our human ancestors. In September 2015, they were identified as belonging to a previously unknown early human relative that expedition under Lee Berger, a National Geographic explorer, and team named that finding Homo naledi. There are still many fossils to be uncovered and new fossils from a second cave chamber, which I think we might have some of on today, and a lot more to be revealed down there. Um, I'm excited for everyone else to join us today. Um, classes that are watching on YouTube Live, feel free to leave questions in the sidebar. There's folks that are on with me online, not in this room, but next door, that are monitoring that. So if you're joining us from YouTube Live, you're not one of the classes directly in the Hangout, uh, please shoot us some questions. I'll try to loop them in. And now I'm going to pass it over to Becca and friends. All right. Um, hi, my name is Becca, and this is Marina. And behind us is one of our cave explorers. This is Rick. And we are sitting right now in the command center on the surface of the, uh, well, just under the surface of the Rising Star Cave. And about 30 meters below us and a couple hundred meters off to the side, we have um, Stephen and Matabella who are down in the cave. Uh, and we're going to tell you about what we've been doing. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit of uh, background. As Jordan said, um, we started uh, in these cave systems in 2013. Um, in fact, Rick and Steve found the material uh, in a very deep area of this cave system. Um, and they found some bones that, that looked like something that might be interesting. Uh, Lee Berger, who is an explorer in residence at Nat Geo, and he recognized them as being something uh, hominin and so mounted this expedition. Becca and I were chosen along with four other with the excavation of and recovery of this material, in part because all of us had caving and climbing experience and the uh, route to this cave is quite difficult. Um, I'll let Steve and Matabella maybe describe that a little bit better in a few minutes. But the, the cave is, is quite difficult to get through and the material is, is far away from where we're sitting right now. As Becca said, about 200 meters away from us sort of horizontally, but it's 30 meters underground. So um, we get very dirty and it's sometimes very bruised. But um, as Jordan said, the, the results were exceptional. The material that we got out was, was really interesting. But I'll just maybe show you a little bit of what the cave looks like. Um, this, we're just, I know it's going to be a bit jumpy. So the command center here is actually in sort of a skylight room at the entrance to the cave. You can maybe see there's a bit of a skylight up there. But it's it's sort of a, a typical cave for this part of the world. It's um, it's got some large chambers. It's got some um, very tight squeezes. Um, it's mostly made of, of dolomite. It's an ancient seabed. Um, the guys can maybe go into that as well. And it's probably more interesting for us to move over to Stephen and Matabella, who are actually in an area called the Hill Antechamber, just um, about 20 meters away from the Dinaletti Chamber, where we started in 2013. Hi guys, can you can you uh, is this, can you give a little test test? I, think I see your mouths moving, but I don't know if you guys are quite talk. Uh, I don't okay, know if we it looks. Can... Yeah, it looks like we froze for a second. Can you still hear us? I can still hear you, folks, back in the main chamber. Um, I put the camera back on you guys. Um, if you guys want to talk a little there bit, more, can they, can you pick up their audio? Uh, we're not hearing them. They might need to unmute their own microphone, though. 
Gotcha. I see them. I see them as being unmuted. Now we can hear you. Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Too. Yep, we can hear you guys. Go ahead. Sorry, we've got a bit of a delay here. Um, yeah, so we're sitting in the hill antechamber. Um, just behind us is the main excavation area that we've been working on for the past three weeks. And um, we'll show you around a little bit in a moment. Um, yeah, we are about 100 meters away from the guys at the surface, and we're 30 meters vertically underground in one of the deepest sections of this cave. Um, so, yeah, so as they said, the, we've, Rick and I found the fossils in this cave back in 2013. And since then, we've been assisting with excavations on a regular basis. What's that? Anything for me? Um, <clears throat> getting down here, it's, it's really not easy. <laughs> As Marina said, you get bruised. And um, it's very, very difficult to get down here. <laughs> All right, so we'll um, show you around the chamber a bit. So I'm going to move the camera. Okay. okay, you're gonna move the camera. All right. Right. Watch out there. The chair. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What are you pointing at? Okay. So um I've got to watch that side. <laughs> All right. So um we're currently pointing at an excavation pit where we've been working for the past three weeks. Um, we had basically a big block, absolutely full of very fragile fossils in that pit. And over the last few days, we've, well, mostly Marina and Becca have actually put plaster of Paris around the entire block, similar to what you would do if you had a broken arm or broken leg. And then we slowly covered it up put it inside the bag with lots of padding. And yesterday afternoon, we finally managed to get that entire block out of the cave. It was a very big struggle. Um, so we're going to show you one of the routes that, well, how we get into the cave and then also how we got that block of fossils out. So if you can look up there, you will see um, a rope coming down out of the ceiling as well as a ladder. At the top of this ladder is a very tiny little squeeze um, that is the chute and the only entry point into this place. It's only 18 centimeters wide at its narrowest point. And I can tell you it's a real mission getting in and out of here. And it was a real mission getting that bag in and out. Above us in the ceiling, you will also see some really nice stalactites. Um, this cave is but a lot of them, and it's a really stunning place to work in. So definitely the best office I've ever had. Yeah. 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 And then to our right and walking, going down a passage. Let's see on the screen. That is the um, hallway that leads into the main Dinner Lady chamber. And that's where we found the original fossils back in 2013 and where those original 1,500 fossils of Homo and Lady came out. Yeah. So, Jordan? Yes. Um, can everybody hear me again? Yep, you're good, and the camera's back on you. OK, great. Um, so just to add to what Stephen was saying there, um, that that group of fossils that we found in 2013, as we said, is, is from an area called the Dinaletti Chamber. We're working a little bit upslope from that area, about 20 meters where Steve and Matabella are now. And as they described, we took out this very large block of, of kind of amalgamated fossils, little bits and scraps that we didn't want to try and excavate out and instead just wanted to try and kind of jack it and take out as, a, as one mass so that we didn't lose some of the integrity of, of this very delicate material. But one of the other really exciting parts about this chamber is that it's quite a large system. We've only managed to map about maybe two and a half to three kilometers of this system, and there's a lot more um, to it than, than we know yet. 
but in another part of the system, just actually around the corner from where we're sitting here in a different direction from the Dinaletti chamber is another chamber called the Lissetti chamber. And that material is also home in the Letty, but it's quite separate from the Dinaletti material. The Dinaletti material, as Steve mentioned, um, we've recovered now almost um, 1,500 fossil fragments from the Dinaletti chamber. We've now uh, taken about six or 700 out of the Lissetti chamber. And the Dinaletti chamber, we've uh, got about 15 individuals represented, everything from, from tiny babies all the way up to older adults. And in the Lissetti chamber, we have another three individuals, probably two adults, maybe three, and another infant. So um, the Homonoletti material is quite interesting, not just for how remote we are finding the material, but also that we're finding so, so much in, in terms of the material and also so many different individuals from all age groups. So that's something that's really interesting. That's awesome. And then maybe um, I'll have Rick um, describe maybe a little bit more about how they found it, um, the original Dinaletti material, because uh, that was, I think, quite an, an arduous journey. But I'm going to step away and let him sit in the chair so that the kids can actually meet him properly. Awesome. Great. Welcome, Rick. How's it? <laughs> uh, the, the night that we came exploring, looking and discovered the Homo Naledi fossils, uh, Stephen and I were out looking to expand the cave, trying to find an area where no one had ever been. And we arrived here at about six o'clock in the evening. Nighttime caving trip, sun's down, so no issues. We head off into the cave to an area we were trying to push, and it ended up to be the size of a table. It was tiny, there was nothing worth looking for there. So I asked Stephen to take me to a more difficult part of the cave. He took me up the dragon's back, I had my GoPro running, he was in front of me, and we got to this little tiny squeezy bit at the end of the this little narrow passage at the top. And he was in my way, and there were pretty formations uh, on the other side of him. So I asked him to try to give me a way that I could get past. He squeezed down into this little gap, and I stepped over him. And he saw that this little gap that he had crawled into actually went further down. And that is what ended up to be the shoot. About five minutes of him trying to crawl all the way down, he shouted up to me and said, it goes. As a caver, that is the best thing that you can hear because it, it's something new, something that where you've never, ever been before. And I followed down this route and got uh, terribly stuck and eventually got out and it opened up into this chamber that the meters off the ground and one tiny little slick wall that's very slippery trying to get your way down, slowly worked down into it moved through the passage where Stephen showed you now and sat and uh, took a little bit of a break there and then carried on moving. Through there, we pushed on about another two hours or so and then came back. And that's when we saw some of the fossils on the floor and looked around a little bit further and found a few other pieces and saw teeth. And then we saw the mandible that started everything. And we, the GoPro had died. There was no battery left in that, and we didn't have any cameras. So we couldn't get any of the material out, couldn't take photos of it. So we uh, hit the, came back to the surface and had to come back a week later to, to photograph everything. And that's what caused all of this to happen. Very cool. Thank you for that additional information. That's so awesome. It sounds like it was treacherous, but definitely worthwhile. Um, do you guys oh, have... Yes. Do you guys have other things that you want to add before getting into Q&A? Do our friends down in the nearby the Dinaletti Chamber, do you guys have anything to add? No. No? Well, that was awesome. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate that background information. I think it's a good time to jump in and let our classrooms ask some questions. And I know there's a bunch of people watching online, too. But why don't we start with our classes? Um, since there's so many of you, why don't we kind of, I'll give you a little bit of an order so you can prepare so you're not super surprised when you get up to the camera, you know when you're going to ask the questions. So we're going to start with um, Graber Elementary. It's a fourth grade in Hutchinson, USA. Shout out, shout out to y'all. You guys are going to go first, so get ready. Next up would be Catalyst Charter Middle School, calling from Ripon, United States. Next would be HKMS, a seventh grade class, calling in from Easton. Then Mountain View will be fourth from Bristol, USA. Our Lady of Victories will be our fifth school from Sayreville, United States. And then one more classroom from the US 
the Laurel Springs School, which I understand it is a virtual school with lots of kids coming from different places. So um, that is really awesome that so many of you guys could join. Um, so I will now swing it over to the Graber Elementary School and unmute your mic. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi, my name is Jaden. Is it fun to explore in a cave? Yeah. The question is, is it fun to explore in the cave? And it is absolutely fun to explore in the cave. It is hard work and we get really dirty and we get bruised up, but I wouldn't want to work anywhere else. It's so much fun. There's always something new around the corner and we find lots of fossils in these caves. And the best part for me is that I get to work with a totally awesome team, Rick and Steve and Matabella and Marina and some other folks who aren't here today. And it's just great that we get to um, have people with different skill sets, different get different things that everyone is good at. And all together, we make a really great team for exploring and, and excavating in these caves. Great, that's an awesome first question. Does anyone else from that school have another question? And just a reminder, um, since none of us know each other, when you come up and ask a question, please introduce yourself, um, your name, and maybe what grade you're in. All right, sounds like someone's back up at the camera. I'm switching it to you. Okay, go Hi there. My name is Javen. Is there bugs in the cave? <laughs> <laughs> Did you catch that? <laughs> So are, are there bugs in the cave? Yes. Yeah, we're curious about the bug life. Uh, we, we, we have a harvest bin, which are very similar to daddy long neck spiders. We've, we do have spiders in the caves. We've got millipedes about that length. Uh, try to get on the camera. <laughs> about 10, 15 centimeters long. We've got many different types of bugs in these caves. Some of the bugs in these caves are completely white because they don't... They're, they're adapted to live in a dark environment, so they don't need any kind of coloring. They're white, almost translucent. You almost think you could see through them. We saw one today that was very tiny with way too many legs, but it was, and it was very, very um, almost colorless. You could almost see through it. It was pretty cool. Fun cave specific species. All right, those are great questions from Graber Elementary. Um, we're gonna do two questions per reminder. Introduce yourself when you come up to the mic. And why not the next questions we have our friends that Steve and Montebella, if you guys wanna answer since you um, haven't got a chance yet, maybe you will be the question answers this time. And our next class is Catalyst Charter Middle School. I'm gonna unmute your mic now and the camera is on you guys. Has like the theory of the burial grounds led to like any other theories, maybe about it as a memorial or just a decom decomposition place? Stephen Mastabella, you're up. Yeah. So the question was, right? Are there any additional theories about the burial sites in terms of being a memorial site or anything like that? Um, <laughs> Becca, Marina, do you want to take this one? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I can't take it, no worries. Um, yeah, the, so it's an excellent question. And, and for those of you who maybe don't have the background to it, um, the Dinaletti and the Lissetti chambers, one of the, the theories that we have about it is that because they're in, they were found in such a remote area and it's very difficult to get to, and all of these bones were found in very small space, very concentrated, but we didn't find any other animals with these bones. And so there's a number of, of factors that, that suggested to us that this material was being brought into these caves. Now, if you have a look at National Geographic magazine, where you can see a reconstruction of Homo naledi, you realize that, that Homo naledi is very much not human the same way we are. And so it was a big question for everyone as to whether a species that was very much not human could be doing something that we thought was human, meaning taking, you know, treating their dead in a, in a special way. And we still, after 
you know, almost four years have not come up with a better explanation that fits the evidence that we've got than that they were being brought into these spaces deliberately. So we don't, we tend not to use the word burial because that has all kinds of other different meanings, but we do think still that uh, Homo naledi was bringing its dead into these systems very deliberately. Great, thanks for that. And I'm gonna go back to that school, Catalyst Charter Middle School. Um, do you guys have another question? All righty, here comes the question, friends of Rising Star, here it comes. What dangers do you face while excavating? Fantastic question. Okay. This is one I think Matabella and Steve can take. Great, I'll swing it over to them. Camera's on you guys. All right, um, there are many dangers, dangers you can face while excavating because um, we are, there's like rocks everywhere and if you can, I'm gonna move the camera a bit. If you can look at this here, yeah, this is a this is a ladder. So you need to sit on this because you don't you don't want to destroy the excavation site. So that what might happen to you is that sometimes if you like you can get bruised, and not only excavate the dangers are not only when it comes to excavating. Even getting down here, there are a lot of dangers because you can. If you're not careful enough, which we are, um, you might accidentally fall inside. As they told you, it's very small and it's very high. So there are many dangers. Even damaging, I, I can consider that as one of the dangers. You know, you can damage the fossils because these these fossils are the reasons why we come down here. So it's one of the things that you um, might do if you're not careful, damage the fossils, which you don't want to do that. All right. Great. Thank you. All righty. We've got another class that we're going to now. Thanks to Calistar and Moscow. Those are awesome questions. HKMS. I'm going to try and find you guys here in the Hangout. Let's see. Gotcha. Okay. I'm going to unmute your mic now. Okay. So my question. Sorry, you're a little bit quiet right now. It's hard to hear. Can you uh, maybe come closer to the mic? I'll increase your volume a little bit now, but if you could say that question again a little bit louder, please. Oh, what's the Hmm. It was still breaking up a little bit. Um, we want to know what kind of tools you guys use. Ah, there we go. Okay, going back to, let's see. Um, Steve, do you want to take this one? I can tell you some of the things, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> we have a lot of tools just to get into the cave. Um, as you can see, all of us are wearing helmets and lights going into the cave. We have um, coveralls that all of us wear to protect ourselves, our clothing, everything. Um, to get into the cave, we go up something called the dragon's back, and for that we have harnesses and ropes, and we are attached to the equipment as um, a safety precaution. Um, and that's just like tools to get into the cave and get us moving in and out safely. Then in terms of the excavation stuff, um, Matabella here is getting at some stuff and can show you some of that. So a lot of it is, I don't know if they can see it, <laughs> but I'm getting it closer to the camera. But too close maybe? Yeah, it's yeah. Not too close maybe. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> um, so we use a lot of uh, toothpicks, um, very soft things that don't um, damage the bones themselves. Um, brushes, little paint brushes, uh, plastic um, spoons and excavation tools. Um, everything that gets out of the cave gets put into uh, Ziploc bags, inside bubble wrap, inside plastic containers to move the fossil safely out of the cave again. And of course, a lot of camera equipment to photograph every single piece that gets taken out of the cave. Great, thanks, Steve. I'm just going to at the oh. top, um, over by the what you guys are calling kind of like the entrance to the chamber. It might be more of the headquarters. Is there something that you guys use there at the top of the cave that is different from what's down there at the bottom? 
Yeah, we have um, some some technology up here. Stephen mentioned the um, that there's camera equipment, and so we have computers that we can watch you on now, and that we can talk to each other in the cave. But we also have. Let's see if it's going to come onto the screen. If it's not too bright. Oops. There we go. Uh, well, it's a little bit blown out in this picture, but this is a security camera looking down on the cave. So in this picture, we can see Stephen and Matabella's back there, and they're sitting on the ladder. Um, it's a little hard to see. We can switch. Maybe this view's a little darker. No. Well, they're waving at you now. You can see them. It's pretty clear for us. They're high-definition cameras, so we get a really good view. Um, but just now, it's not showing up very well. And I just wanted to say one of my favorite excavation tools in this cave um, actually comes from critters that live in the cave itself. There's porcupines that hang out around the entrance to the cave, not too far from where we're sitting right now. And sometimes they drop their quills and their quills make, they're um, some of my favorite excavation tools. They're just soft, sharp enough to move the dirt and soft enough not to damage the fossils. So we sometimes, you know, the porcupines drop their quills. We don't go after the porcupines. <laughs> that's a that's a great fun fact. Thanks for that. And what's the, do you know the specific name of that species, just in case any of the students are wondering, of the porcupine? It's the African porcupine. So it's probably like more than twice the size of a North American porcupine. Wow. <laughs> Big porcupine. Awesome. All right, going back to... Miss Rose's class, HKMS in Easton. Do you guys have another question? I'm unmuting your mic right about now. My name is Jackson. I'm kind of wondering how long have you guys been exploring caves? Great. Why don't we start at the top of the cave? You guys have responses? Okay. Jackson. Well, I think I think all of us actually probably have a different answer. Um, I've been exploring caves since I was quite small. Um, I grew up in Canada in a place uh, near the Badlands so, and also near the Rocky Mountains. So I've been caving for fun for, for a long time. But as a profession, um, I've actually only been doing it since the Rising Star Expedition. But I now live and work full time in South Africa doing um, a lot of excavation and some exploration around. So uh, for me, it's been, yeah, uh, a few years now of doing it for an actual job, which is one of the best jobs you can get, I think. But everybody has a different answer. Yeah, let's ask Montebello what his answer is. And so, let's ask Montebello and Stephen because they have pretty different answers. Um, as for myself, as a profession, I've been doing this for, um, I can say, seven years. Not, not, I mean, two years exploring, but working inside a cave. I've been doing it, I can say, seven years because I started as a tour guide at Stafontein Cave. But Stagfontein, uh, or rather tour guiding, and what I'm doing now is totally different things because that one is easy, low crawling, um, just bend down a little. But with this one, well, there's a lot to do. There's a lot of crawling, a lot of bruises. So I've been doing this for um, two years exploring, but in terms of going inside caves, I can say, Forever, and that's quite a long time because I'm from Lesotho, <laughs> Mountain Kingdom. It's a little country inside South Africa. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been exploring caves for almost eight years now, uh, and for the last four, I've been I'm doing it as a job. Uh, this specific cave, I actually explored for about a period of about three years before Rick and I came in on that Friday night um, and discovered the fossils down here. And yeah, it was pretty much soon after that that I've been doing it as a full-time job, which is just amazing. Great, really fun job that you guys have. Jackson, thanks for that question. We're gonna to move to our fourth classroom um, in Mountain View, Mountain View School in Bristol, USA. Let me find where you guys are at. Oh, thanks for helping me out. You're already at the microphone. Awesome. Uh, camera's on you and I'm unmuting you right now. Hi, my name is Kaden. Um, how long does it take to get from the top of the cave to the bottom? Okay. Fantastic yes, question. Why don't we swing it back to, looks like Rick is ready to answer. Yes. Uh, on average, it takes between 15 and 20 minutes. But depending on what we need to do, it can take a little bit less if something needs to be taken down there quickly. 
or if something needs to come up, it can take about an hour and a half, two hours. Like yesterday's haul, it took a half, uh, 45 minutes to take the block from the cave, uh, from the chamber all the way up to here. Right. And can you, um, Rick, can you say a little bit like what tools or methods are used to kind of carry and deliver the stuff between the different parts of the cave system? Uh, we actually use... Oh, He's getting props. <laughs> there we go. This is a standard caving bag that we pretty much load up with as much gear as possible. It's uh, canvas material, uh, good straps. They don't break. And then we use body harnesses on ourselves when we climb in the more difficult areas throughout the cave just so that in case something does happen, we're not going to fall and get hurt. Super cool. Thanks. All right. Swinging back to the classroom now. Camera's on you guys. And go ahead and ask your next question. Hi, my name is Max, and I want to hear what was the coolest fossil you saw. Great. And let's go. <laughs> the near. coolest fossil I saw? All of these fossils are so cool um, because they each, each one of them helps us understand Homo naledi and understand sort of where um, what our ancient human relatives were like. But Marina and I excavated a hand in 2014, and it was articulated, which means that all the bones in the hand were just like they are in your own hand, in that same order, in that same arrangement, but the skin and the muscles were all gone. So all the bones were there, just like a hand had fallen down, and then all the skin and muscles had gone away. And that's really, really cool to not just see sort of a scramble of bones, but to see all the bones just like they are in your own hand laid out sort of in this position, like with its thumb out and its fingers curled in, just like that. Awesome, thanks for a great question, Max. So moving on to our fifth school, Our Lady of Victory School, calling from Sayerville. I am going to switch the camera to you and unmute y'all. Let's see, you good. All right, your mic should be live now. Um, hi, my name is Brooke, and I wanted to know where the fossils are taken after they're excavated. Oh, excellent question. Um, so once the fossils come up out of the ground here, they actually get taken to the University of the Witwatersrand, which is in Johannesburg, South Africa. And it's the university that I now work for and that most of us work for. Um, so I usually take them to the lab. They get opened up because when they come out of the ground, obviously they're very dirty. They're quite damp. One of the things that we didn't mention is that the cave here um, is quite warm underground. It's about 18 degrees Celsius. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, but um, and it's also at 99% humidity. So the, the fossils are often very damp when they come out. So we take them to the laboratory we open up their, their packaging and let them dry out very slowly. Then once, that's, once they're dry, they get cleaned and processed and labeled, identified. If we can find pieces that fit back together again, then we, we try to fit them together. Um, and in that way, it's kind of like working on the world's best jigsaw puzzle, um, except you're putting, putting a new species together. And um, so yeah, they, they go to the university and then once once they've been cleaned and put back together, then they actually go into a fossil vault at the university and then they're made available for researchers to come and study them. Thanks, and for those students who are wondering, the, <laughs> the uh, conversion between Celsius and Fahrenheit in that instance is 18 degrees Celsius equals 64.4 degrees Fahrenheit. So not too bad, actually. It seems like a pretty reasonable temperature to spend your time in. Uh, we're going to go back to the classroom. Brooke, thanks for that question. Uh, camera's on you guys, and I'm unmuting your mic right now. Hi, my name's Bomery, and have you ever been on any excavations? And what's the closest artifact you found for that? Can, can you repeat the question, please? Sorry. Have you ever been to any other excavations and what's the coolest artifact you found from them? Oh. Marina and I have both been on, on lots of other excavations that aren't in this in this cave in South Africa. Um, I've worked um, all, up and down, all up and down the East Coast of the United States 
and especially in Southern Virginia in a place called the Great Dismal Swamp. And I know Marina has worked um, in, well, you can tell them. Yeah, um, I've worked in uh, Central Siberia in Lake Baikal. I've worked in Northern Alaska and also along the West Coast in Canada. Um, and I've done both archeological excavations and forensic body recoveries. Wow, <laughs> that's pretty crazy. Forensic bodies, wow. <laughs> Um, Steve and Montebello, do you guys have anything to add? Um, I haven't worked on that many other excavation sites, but I have been to um, a lot of other caves in South Africa and discovered a lot of other very interesting caves in South Africa, um, including uh, the one of the biggest and deepest caves in the country. Well, um, I haven't worked in um, most of the or other sites. I've worked at this one and the one called uh, Malaba. Um, and I've also been in other caves as well here in South Africa and other caves in the Um I'm jealous that I've never been to that big one that Stephen is talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe one day you can get Steve to take you. Hopefully he'll be a good friend and bring you along. Um, thanks to the class, to the question, awesome questions coming from Our Lady of Victory School. And we're going to swing now to our final class. And hopefully, there'll, there'll still be time to go around, I think, maybe one more lap of the classes for one question each. But moving to the Laurel Spring School with Miss Wafer, I'm going to unmute your mic now. Camera's on you. And you can hear me great. So I'm in a virtual classroom with students who are around the world. Um, Anjali's in Ireland, and she said to tell you that her mom is from South Africa, Tom is in Switzerland, Sam's in Indiana. So we have students um, all over the world, and so I'm in two, on two screens here, and they're asking me questions. So I have a couple of questions. Um, Hannah and Alexandria ask similar questions, and Hannah is in seventh grade from Minnesota. Alexandria is in Texas, and she's a junior. And their questions are, uh, do you know what happened to these people in the cave? And what do you hope to learn from analyzing these fossils when you're done? Um, awesome questions. Um, what have we learned? Right? Yeah, what have we learned? Um, yeah, about so what happened to them? That's an, that's an excellent question. We actually don't know yet what happened to these individuals. Um, one of the interesting things that we don't see in these bones is any signs of them being um, killed by a predator or their bones being eaten by a scavenger, as often happens with other species in this area. So we don't see any of the marks like that. The other thing that we don't see in these bones are signs of injury or, or breakage that indicate that maybe they fell down a shaft into this cave. So we don't see any patterns of, of breakage like that. So um, we really don't know yet. But sometimes, you know, people have asked us, well, maybe they died of, of a disease or maybe they were all swept away by a flood or something. Um, unfortunately, so far, we don't have any good evidence for any of that. Um, a disease might have killed some of these individuals and not shown it on the bones. But that would be unusual because we know that the bones came into the chamber at different times. So it would have to be a disease that kind of picked individuals periodically and then took them all into the same place, which wouldn't make a lot of sense. But um, so far, we, we really don't have a good answer for, for what any one individual died of. But that's one of the questions that we're hoping to answer. And there's basically all kinds of questions that we have about these bones that we, we haven't answered yet and that part of why we come out and do these expeditions periodically, we're hoping to answer. So um, the iceberg in understanding this species so far, we're, we've got lots of years left. We have colleagues who are working on specific questions, like we have colleagues who look at the teeth of, the, of Homo naledi to help understand maybe what they ate and what their, what their lifespan was like. So we have teeth of little tiny babies and teeth of older adults. Um, we have other colleagues who work on different parts of the skeleton, like the shoulders, to find out how they were using their arms, and, and colleagues who study just that hand that, and other hand bones that we found um, to understand, you know, were they capable of using tools? The answer to that one is yes. And, and you know, how, do their hands, how are their hands similar and different from ours, and what can we learn about that, about 
how they interacted with their environment and, and what you know sort of what their daily lives were like. Awesome. And Miss uh, Miss Waver, do you have another question? Um, yeah, um, I actually live near Mammoth Caves, which I think is one of the biggest cave systems in North America. And that brings me to Sam's question. He's in Illinois and an eighth grader. So how deep, because Mammoth Caves are pretty big. I've been in them several times. Anybody who comes to visit me wants to go to Mammoth Cave. Um, how deep do these caves go? I think you guys said you're 30 meters down, but do you know how far the cave system actually goes? Yeah, Stephen, maybe you can take that. Yeah, so um, Mammoth Cave is definitely the biggest cave in the world with over 600 kilometers of cave passages. The caves in South Africa are unfortunately a lot smaller. Um, the Rising Star Cave system, so far we know of only over four kilometers of passages. So it's a much smaller cave and in general our caves are a lot smaller than the caves that you find in America. But we have some really interesting things in them, um, like, for instance, Hobana Lady and so many other fossils, such as the fossils at Starkfontein, Malapa, and many other sites around here. We've got some really interesting stuff that makes up for our smaller size caves. Great. Ms. Weber, thanks for those awesome questions coming from your, your students calling in from a virtual school. That's really cool. I love that you guys are joining our virtual classroom here with National Geographic, and you are also a virtual school. Great stuff there. Um, we've got, let's see, probably five more minutes. So I'm going to open up to the classes. And instead of going one by one, why not, if you have a question, just come right up to the camera, wave so I know that you're ready. And I'll uh, unmute your mic and put the camera on you. So let me check and see if you guys, why don't you come on up to the camera if you have a question. I see some milling around. Maybe, oh, anyone? Or I could put on my teacher hat and just pick and call on you guys. <laughs> oh, great. Okay, there is someone up at the camera calling from the school in Ripon, in the United States. I'm going to unmute you guys, unmute you guys right now. Find out the gender. How do you find out the gender of the? fossils you find and how long does it take? Sure, uh, well, it's pretty tricky to figure out the sex of these fossils. We don't know anything about their gender because gender gender and sex are kind of different things. Um, sex is something that, that we think that we can see in potentially in DNA, but also maybe in the skeleton. You know, we think of um, different shapes of pelvis, um, and different markers on the skull and the jaw and so forth, but that are slightly different between males and females in, in modern humans. And we're still trying to understand what that looks like in Homo naledi. Um, some species that, that kind of look like Homo naledi but aren't Homo naledi, they have sexual dimorphism. So the males are a lot bigger than the females, for example. Um, we see that even in, in uh, other primates that are still on earth today. Um, but we're still trying to figure that out for Homo naledi. It's, we, it's, a, it's a process. We have a whole bunch of fossils, but we still have to have more, I think, before we can really get a handle on what does a male Homo naledi skeleton look like versus a female Homo naledi skeleton. There, one of the cool things about doing this kind of science is the more, you, the more you find, the more questions you get to ask about it. So, so true. And then we've got another great question. That was another great question, thanks. Um, and we're moving on to, let's see. Oh. We have a friend that's standing, ready to go, calling from the Mountain View School. I will unmute your mic right now. Hi, I'm Abby. I want to know how old the fossils you found are. Fantastic question. And you know what? For almost two and a half years, everybody wanted to know how old the Homo naledi fossils were because we didn't know at the beginning when we brought them out of the ground how old they were. And from the way Homo naledi looks, a lot of people guessed that they would be much, much older than we found out that they are. So a lot of people thought that they would be maybe one, 1.5 million years old. But we found out just a few months ago that Homo naledi is actually 350 to 250,000 years old. And that's really amazing because it means that maybe Homo naledi 
and humans were on the planet at the same time. And we don't know whether they interacted at all yet, but um, they certainly could have overlapped in time on the planet, which is pretty cool. Really, really cool. Abby, thanks for an awesome question. We have time for, it looks like, one more question, and we have someone ready. Um, so go ahead, introduce yourself. It's, once again, a student calling from Our Lady of Victory School in Sayreville, United States. I will unmute your mic right now. Hi, my name is Mason, and I watched a video of a 3D scan of the caves, and I was wondering, were you a part of that scan? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we were. Um, in fact, the caving team and I, there were, I think, five or six of us uh, involved in the, the scanning of the cave. And, but I'll maybe pass it over to Steve because, um, yeah, I think he can describe how, how much fun that was over the three or four days that we did it. Steve? I'm just going to switch on an extra light here. Getting a bit in the dark here. Um, yeah. So we took this really big 3D scanner down, this really expensive piece of equipment, and we're basically just told, don't drop it, don't let it fall, because it's more expensive than any of us. Um, of course, the scanner had to be on a tripod, and now you're trying to move through this extremely difficult cave, trying to balance it on a tripod above 10 meter drops and all kinds of things like that. And at the same time, the whole scanner needs to be able to spin around to be able to do all things around it and scan the cave. Um, I think we spent two weeks or something here, um, moving slowly from one chamber into the next. And we actually only did a tiny little fragment of the entire cave. But the scan does look amazing. Great. Thank you so much, guys. We are out of time, but this was an awesome another episode of Explore Classroom down with the Rising Star Cave Crew. Thanks to all the classrooms that joined us in this hangout. Thanks to everyone that's watching on YouTube Live. And thank you to our explorers, cavers, biologists, anthropologists. Really appreciate you guys chatting with us today about not only the scientific research you're doing, but I love how you incorporated themes of teamwork and collaboration, because at the end of the day, that is super important and always a good reminder for our students and and friends to know about. So thanks everyone. I'm going to unmute the mics. So you can say goodbye to all our friends in the caves in South Africa. It's great having everyone on today. Your mics are alive. <laughs>